Hey folks, welcome back to Holy Spirit Soapbox. If this is your first time here, welcome. My name is Dan, I'm your host. If it's your 70th time here, it's me again, Dan, your host. <laughs> and I'm so glad you're here. I'm glad you're all here. And I want to thank you for joining in today. I, I really, we all really appreciate the prayers. We really do. We're seeing this reach so many people across the world and we want to give them Jesus. We want people to hear who Jesus is and, and who God is and understand his heart. So we're so appreciative of all of you and please continue to reach out to us let us know your thoughts on the podcast let us know if these are blessing you we'd love to hear from you but today we're going to talk about jealousy and covetousness and envy and if you're a human you've witnessed this in yourself at least one time (laughs) in your life I don't care how old you are you could have been like three years old everybody gets jealous and everybody gets covetous and everybody has this envy and they're all one and the same pretty much. They all slightly mean something a little bit different, but ultimately jealousy, covetousness, and envy are very similar things. So I'm going to start off by admitting my own jealousy. Okay. We had this amazing yard at our old old house. We talked about it in You'll Miss the Sunset where our landscaper designed this beautiful place for us to enjoy as a family. Okay, this beautiful yard, this beautiful place in Colorado. And then we recently moved to a new house in a new area, a new state, and the yard's not the same one. It's not as great as our old old house. You know, since a few weeds infiltrated the yard and they established themselves, so these roots are, like, thick, you know, and I, I can't, like, yank them out. I have to, like... For, they just keep popping up everywhere. And in the yard, the grass itself is not like great and perfect the way I, I like it, okay? And it's still great. It really is. Don't get me wrong. But I, I just happen to take a peek at our neighbor's yard next door. And that yard looks 50 times better than mine, <laughs> okay? So I guess naturally, as a human, I got jealous. I got covetous. Have you ever done that before? Like you see somebody drive by in like a Lamborghini and you're like, Oh, man, (laughs) I want that. I want that. Honestly, have you ever felt jealous, covetous, or envious before? It's a stupid question, I know. But seriously, think back to a time where you were jealous, covetous, or envious of somebody else or somebody else's stuff. Another story. I had this conversation with someone recently who was talking about the people in his family who own houses. He said his dad owned a house for years, his siblings, his friends, and even his son, but it seemed like every time he tried to buy a house or even thought about it, something got in the way where he couldn't do it. He just couldn't buy a house. I believe it's Joyce Meyer who had a sermon or or the series on this whole what about me mindset that can really derail us from looking to God. We have so many things. We We can have so many things including eternal life. You know, when we give our lives to Jesus, we get eternal life. But those pesky little wants, you know, when our eyes wander a little bit, that gets us wondering, what about me? They have it. Why can't I? And I focused so much on our neighbor's yard that I was spending loads of time outside fixing the yard, pulling the weeds, and spending a bunch of money buying things to make it look better, that it looked, it just engulfed my time that I could have spent with my family and my friends and my church and it just still leads me to feeling empty and that person who doesn't have the house that really wants one may be so focused on buying a house that he misses the other great things that he has right in front of him this is the I want if you you have a chance to write this down write it down and bold it right or underline highlight it Contentment starts with being thankful for what you have right now. That's where contentment starts. And then continuing to be thankful for what you have in every single moment, you will be content. God has given you all that you need. If you've given your life to Jesus, you have everything you need at this very moment. Even if you feel like you don't have anything. Even if you don't have a meal on your table tonight. And if you don't, seriously, please contact me. I will send you a meal, okay? But... Even if you feel like you have nothing, you have everything. God gives us everything we need, eternal life included. The harsh reality is our lives can end at any moment. 
It's, it's just the realest fact that there is. Should we spend every day worrying about not owning something like a Lamborghini? Okay, really? Or how green the grass is on the other side? Literally, I was that guy in the old in that old quote. The grass is literally greener on the other side of my fence. I'm serious. But is that how we should live? Knowing that we can die at any moment? That's the harsh reality? You know, unfortunately... A lot of that jealousy or coveting of other people's lives or materials can lead us to more issues, such as digging ourselves deeper into debt or doing drastic things to others so that we can benefit and get what we think we need. Now, I love these verses from Paul in Philippians 4. If you have a Bible, feel free to read along with me. It's in the description as well, so you can refer back to it later. But he's praising the Philippians in Philippians 4 for helping him out while he was needy but says this in chapter 4, verses 10 through 13. I'm reading from the New King James Version, but here we go. He says this, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I've learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to be abound. Everywhere and in all things I've learned both to be full and to be hungry both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This guy, (laughs) Paul, some might argue that his life got really hard. I mean, he made people's lives hard when he was a Pharisee and he was getting Christians killed, but some argue that his life was just really, really hard. I mean, he got into a, a boat accident. He got into a scuffle a lot of scuffles where people were beating him up and he was beat to a pulp to the point that he was like dead he was starved he didn't have enough to eat he just was wandering all the time probably lost a lot of weight he got imprisoned and then he got killed he went through it okay he went through it and he says this and mind you he is writing this while in prison that whatever state he was in he was content Everything that he quote-unquote has, which we really don't have anything, everything that he has is gone, and he's left to be rotting in a cell until his death date. He has nothing, but he says he has everything. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm sure you've heard this vo- this verse before. A lot of people have it tattooed on them, or a lot of people wear the shirt or the hat, and, and it says this verse. And it's a great verse. Don't get me wrong. But what he's trying to say here is I can be starving or I can be full. I know what it's like to be both. I know what it's like to be poor. I know what it's like to be rich. I know what it's like to have things. I know what it's like to have nothing. I know what it's like to be free and I know what it's like to be in prison. But I am free. I have everything. And I can do all these things through Christ because it's Christ who's doing it. It's not me. I'm not the one feeding myself. I'm not the one that's doing all these things. I'm being given these things by you Philippians, but also by the people that love Christ because Christ wants to continue to preach. Christ wants to continue to work in us so that God can be glorified. And he's saying this. He's saying it's not me, it's Christ. So I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But no matter the circumstance, Paul was content Even in prison, he rejoiced and sang. He was content because he has Christ. He has eternal life. He needs nothing more. Let's also look at King Solomon. This man is a direct descendant of David. He's his son and had everything. He had everything. And when I mean everything, I'm talking about worldly things. We talk about possibly knowing some of the richest people on earth, like the Elon Musks and the Bill Gates and the Jeff Bezos and all these people with billions of dollars, which is great and everything. But this man had all of it. Now, we don't know exactly how much he had, but he had all of the riches, all of the food, several wives and more. Okay. But this all in mind, he asked God for wisdom, which led him to writing Ecclesiastes. In this book, after a quick intro, He literally starts off saying this in verse 2 and verse 3 of chapter 1. He says, Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. He calls himself the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What profit has a man from all his labor in which he toils under the sun? One of the definitions of vanity, aside from pride, is lack of real value or hollowness or worthlessness, according to dictionary.com. 
And what's interesting is the word chabel that Solomon uses that translates to vanity here also translates to vapor or breath. And James in the New Testament also talks about life just being a vapor. It's empty, void, quick, and almost like the the wind. It just blows away. And Solomon is a man who has everything you can ask for. Again, worldly things. He has all the gold and all this stuff. But he calls all of this stuff pointless. We work and work and work and work. And we still feel empty. So we work some more and we feel more empty. And then when we're dissatisfied and discontent, we look over the fence to the other side to see what kind of grass a neighbor has. <laughs> right? And we ask those questions. That, that one question, what about me? Jealousy, covetousness, and envying are all a full result of discontentment. There's a reason why the Tenth Commandment is, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You should not covet your neighbor's wife or your neighbor's husband, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that's your neighbor's. Exodus 20.17 says this. Because it only creates division, and it ultimately brings your focus away from God. Your satisfaction now comes from worldly things. Your contentment now comes from worldly things, from the grass, from the money, from the house itself, from the cars, from anything that somebody else has. And it, it doesn't even have to be your neighbor. It's not your neighbor. When in Exodus, we're talking about they say neighbor because everybody was pretty much a neighbor at the time. And you consider these people your neighbor, you know, that's in the same community as you. It could be anybody. You're driving along. Somebody could be wearing a shirt. Better than you can wear that same shirt or something. You can be jealous about anything. It's crazy. You can envy people. And it's impossible to love your neighbor or love anybody, as Jesus tells us to do, if you envy them. It's impossible to love them because you envy them, because you're jealous of them or you covet something they have. Understanding that Jesus is literally everything we need should give us this gratitude and this thankfulness that we can, that we can never explain. If you were in a prison cell, would you sing songs of praise and tell others to rejoice in the Lord always? And again, I say rejoice. This is Philippians 4.4. 4. Would, you, would you be doing that? Paul says rejoice always. Not sometimes. And not if you have a good yard like your neighbors. Not if you finally get the house you want. Not even if you paid your bills for the month. Always. Always. These are small achievements. Yes, and we should celebrate these achievements, but we should be rejoicing in the Lord through all circumstances and know that we have everything we need in Christ Jesus. Now, hopefully, wherever you are right now listening, you say amen, because I hope this blesses you, and I hope that if there's something that you're you're seeking after that might be taking your attention away from God that's worldly, stop and pray about it. Just recognizing it is the first step. And just knowing that, wow, I can't put all of my satisfaction in this. Because if, if I never get it, or even if I do get it, I probably will want the next big thing. Or I want the next thing. We're never satisfied in worldly things, period. We never are satisfied in worldly things. So when we're jealous of other people, when we envy other people, or when we're covetous of what they have, it's because you're not content with what you have. So take the time. Again, remember... Contentment starts with thankfulness and gratitude for what you have right now. Okay? Remember that as you move along your day or night. Okay? Here's some verses to meditate on. Okay? So the first one is Psalm 23 1. We all know this one. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We recite this often. And the I shall not want part is very important. David is saying he has everything he needs. He's making the decision right now to not seek anything more than God because he has everything he needs in God. Next is Ecclesiastes 1, the whole chapter 1. You know, definitely read this chapter and meditate on it because you can almost feel the pain in Solomon's writing. Again, it might be hard to have pity or empathy for a man that has all the money, jewels, etc. But he felt so empty and void even with those things. He you almost have to feel bad for the guy. We can be jealous of Solomon or we can learn from him. That's the important part here, okay? And then Philippians 4, read the whole chapter as well. This is the closing chapter and ending of a short letter to the people of Philippi who Paul loved. He loved them. 
He gives them some nice closing statements to those who were so abundant in their giving to the church, including him. Now, Paul was a tent maker, which means that he made tents, literally, to pay for his travels across to spread the gospel. He tried to buy his own food and find his own lodging or probably sleep in his own tent, I assume. But the people of Philippi gave him things. They were very abundant in their giving and also to the church of Christ, the the body of Christ. So he loves them, but definitely read this chapter and meditate on it as well. Finally, three questions, and these are all in description so you can refer back to them, but these three questions are meant to really dig deep into us. We have to be honest with our answers. We have to. We have to be honest, and then we have to meditate and pray about these answers so that we can get guidance and help from God and from the Holy Spirit. But here are your three questions. Question number one is this. Think again of a time that you were jealous or envious or covetous of someone. What did being jealous or envious or covetous of this person solve in your situation? What did it solve by being jealous of them? Question two. If you find yourself being jealous or envious or covetous of somebody or something, what would you change in your life that you think would solve that feeling of jealousy? Is there something, say, if you are covetous of somebody's car, do you think by buying that same car or a better car would make you feel satisfied all of a sudden or, or content or happy? little hint here, this is where your heart is, okay? Your source of joy and contentment and satisfaction in life or in this world, that source is where your heart is, okay? If your source of joy is a house, that's where your heart is. And Jesus has something to say about where your heart is, okay? You either love mammon or earthly, worldly things, or you love the Lord, And that is where your heart should be. It should be in the Lord. But that's, this is the little hint that I'm giving you for this question. If you find yourself being jealous, covetous, or envious, what would you change in your life that you think would solve that feeling? And question three, what are some ways you could put your full satisfaction or contentment back into Jesus Christ? I want to thank you once again for joining in today. We really appreciate you all here at Holy Spirit Soapbox. So thank you for the prayers. We thank you for spreading the word about Holy Spirit Soapbox so that we can spread the word of Jesus Christ and the gospel to everybody across the world. And we want to participate with God and you. So we want to thank you so much for doing that. Please continue to do so. Please continue to tell people about Jesus Christ. That's the most important thing. And I would love to pray over all of us and close this out here. So if you can take your prayer posture, Please do, if it's safe to do so, and let's talk to our Father in Heaven. Our Father, we know you've provided everything we need in Christ Jesus. He has given us contentment, love, peace, joy, hope, eternal life, and and so much more than we can ever imagine. And we want to be able to rest in this. We want to be able to, to feel this contentment and not seek the world for satisfaction or even guidance for our lives. We pray that we can continue to dig into your word for a better understanding of what is given to us and pray for you to lead us away from the jealousy, covetousness, and envy in our minds and our hearts. And we pray all of this in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen.